Please see the link in the description to download a worksheet for this video. Experiments can be dangerous. If you are a child, never do experiments unless your parent, guardian, or adult educator says it's all right and is there with you the whole time. If you've not already done so, we suggest that you watch the video's overview of five wave types in science, an intro to electromagnetic and mechanical waves, before watching this video. Here are some waves near a beach. Here are some waves in a pond. Although all of these waves are made of water, they're very different in many ways. For example, compared with those on the pond, the waves on the beach are much taller, they're moving much faster, and the distance between each wave's crest is much larger. In physics, we use specific words to describe each of these characteristics, and collectively we call those words wave properties. In this video, we'll introduce these wave properties and how to solve some related problems. Amplitude, wavelength, wave speed and velocity, wave frequency, wave period, and reciprocal relationships. We'll begin with wave amplitude. Wave amplitude is the distance between a wave's crest and the equilibrium. To measure the amplitude of these waves, we first need to know the water's level if there were no waves. We call that level the medium's equilibrium. We'll put some black tape just below the equilibrium. Then, we get a picture when there are waves. We call this picture a snapshot. Next, we find a crest. That's the topmost part of a wave, and we measure the distance from the crest to the equilibrium. That distance is the wave's amplitude. For this water wave, the amplitude is 3.5 centimeters. Then we find the trough, which is the lowest point on the wave. We measure its distance from the equilibrium. This is the negative amplitude. For this water wave, the negative amplitude's value is negative 3.5 centimeters. To graph the snapshot, we first draw the y-axis to represent displacement from the equilibrium. A y-value of zero represents the equilibrium. Then we draw an x-axis, which represents distance. We find the value of the amplitude and negative amplitude, and draw those in as dotted lines. Then we sketch the wave, so that the crest and trough touch those dotted lines. The units for displacement are often in centimeters or meters, as in the case of this water wave, and for many waves we can see. But the units are in pressure when we're graphing a sound wave. This animation shows a pressure wave in blue that corresponds with the oscillations of gray dots which represent molecules in the air. When a sound wave propagates, it creates high-pressure regions called compressions, which are followed by low-pressure regions called rarefactions. Please note that the pressure graph is shaped like a sine wave, as are most waves we graph in K-12 education. As we turn up the volume of our speakers, the pressure in the air with each wave gets higher, so the amplitude gets bigger. One way to remember that louder sound waves have waves with a bigger amplitude is to think of an amplifier. Both of these come from the root word amplify, which means to make something bigger. Amplitude is a major factor in how much energy a wave has. That's a primary reason why these ocean waves with large amplitudes have much more energy than those on a pond that have small amplitudes. Next, we'll discuss wavelength. As we noted in the overview video, wavelength is the length of one wave. It's easiest to measure this as the distance between two adjacent wave crests. The wavelength for these water waves is 6 centimeters. We use the Greek letter lambda to symbolize a wave's wavelength. A snapshot graph is useful when we want to know a wave's wavelength. In this case, the wavelength is 100 centimeters. Each key on a piano makes a sound with a specific wavelength. Low pitch notes have long wavelengths and are made by long strings. High-pitched notes have short wavelengths and are made by short strings. Next, we'll introduce wave speed. A wave's speed is how far its crest goes in a certain time. These ocean waves are traveling at about 5 miles an hour. Sound waves go at different speeds based on what they're traveling through. In air, sound waves travel at about 750 miles an hour, which is slightly faster than commercial airplanes. In water, sound waves travel at about 3,000 miles an hour which is faster than the fastest plane that ever flew. In solids like a diamond, sound waves travel at about 40,000 miles per hour. If the Earth's core was made of rocks similar to diamonds, a sound wave could go around the entire Earth in about half an hour. Electromagnetic waves also travel at different speeds depending on what they're traveling through. 
For example, in the air, light travels at about 670 million miles per hour. That means light could go all around the Earth in about the time it takes us to blink. Compared to its speed in air, light goes about 20% slower in water. Light travels at its fastest speed when it's traveling in a vacuum, but it slows to less than half that speed in a diamond. We use the word velocity when we want to describe a wave's speed and the direction the waves are going. For example, we would say these waves have a velocity of 2 miles per hour in the southern direction. We often write this with a V that stands for velocity, and sometimes with a small subscript W that stands for wave. Next, we'll discuss wave frequency. Wave frequency is the number of waves that propagate per second. To measure a wave's frequency, we count how many waves propagate in a second. We'll use this stem as a reference point. There are two waves that pass this stem every second, so the wave frequency is two waves per second. Instead of saying the phrase waves per second, we use the term hertz. It's written like this. It's named in honor of Heinrich Hertz, who discovered radio waves. We typically use a lowercase f to represent frequency. This is a history graph of the lake waves passing the stem. It shows that every second, two waves pass the stem. We use a history graph like this to analyze a wave's frequency. Please note that instead of distance on the x-axis, as with a snapshot graph, we've written time on the x-axis. You had given a test question like this. What's the frequency of this wave? In this case, there is not a wave crest above the one second mark. So we find a crest that's above a number. Then we count the number of waves in the interval between zero and the mark we selected. We know that frequency is defined as the number of waves per second. To calculate the number of waves per second, we divide the number of waves by the seconds. In this case, we get 0.6 waves per second, which we write as f equals 0.6 hertz. To make a history graph, we plot the displacement from the equilibrium of one point in a medium over the course of several seconds. For example, this history graph corresponds to the activity of the red dot in the medium during several seconds. In contrast, a snapshot graph is a picture of all the waves in a medium at one instant in time. Most of the time, the wave frequencies we experience are high numbers. You may recognize this frequency as middle C on a piano. This tuning fork is making a sound with that same frequency. It does that by vibrating exactly 256 times per second. With every vibration, the tuning fork oscillates the air molecules back and forth to produce sound waves with that frequency. This radio wave tower sends out radio waves with a wide range of frequencies. When we tune our radios to a station, we're selecting what frequency waves we want the radio to process. FM frequencies are in the millions of waves per second. In this case, we've tuned the radio to only process radio waves reaching this antenna if they're arriving at 104.5 million waves per second. Our phones and cell towers use even higher frequency radio waves. Those waves have frequencies of about 2 billion waves per second, which we abbreviate by writing 2 gigahertz. Next, we'll discuss wave period. Wave period is the number of seconds for one wavelength to propagate. These ocean waves have a wavelength that spans the distance between adjacent crests. To measure the period, we'll make a vertical line at the front end of a wave. Then, count how many seconds elapse until the back end of the wave crosses that line. In this case, the period is 6 seconds. What's the period for this wave? We can find the length of one wave and estimate that it's about one and a half seconds. But to be more precise, we find a crest that is directly above a hash mark. In this case, there's one above the five second hash mark. Then we count the number of waves in the interval from zero to five seconds. Since the definition of a wave period is the number of seconds in one wave, to calculate the number of seconds per wave, we divide the number of seconds in the interval by the number of waves. In this case, that's 5 seconds divided by 3 waves, which equals 1.67 seconds per wave. The symbol for period is a capital T. Our final topic is the reciprocal relationship between a wave's frequency and its period. We use the same history graph to calculate a wave's frequency and to calculate its period. For the frequency calculation, we divided the number of waves by the seconds. For the period calculation, we divided the number of seconds by the waves. This tells us that a wave's frequency and period are reciprocals of each other. 
We can express a reciprocal relationship in words by using a division bar and by using a division sign. We can switch between frequency and period by dividing the number 1 by the other's value. Here's a tuning fork with a frequency of 512 Hz. What's the period of the waves this tuning fork makes? To convert from frequency to period, we divide 1 by the frequency. In this case, 1 divided by 512. That gives a wave period of two thousandths of a second. Here's a summary of this topic plus some additional information. Please pause the video if you wish to read this. Please subscribe if you'd like to be notified of future educational videos we make. Thanks for your attention.